Hello, and welcome to the Philosopher's Bench. This is the bench, and we are the philosophers. I am Peter Graef. This is Father Ron Tasselli. We both teach philosophy at Boston College. And uh, today we're talking about the problem of suffering. To connect that with our previous topic, atheism, I have to say that I think the only really good argument for atheism is the problem of suffering. If there is a God who loves us, why does he let us suffer so much? What's your fundamental answer to that? Well, Peter, I wish I had uh, just one short, brief, pithy answer to the question. Uh, obviously, God made the world in such a way that real suffering, I don't mean just uh, the suffering of disease, for example, but also moral suffering is possible. And I would say that whenever I've been asked this question, say, by students, it's not really a logical question. In other words, mm -hmm. it's not a matter of, well, look, is there a logical incompatibility between a god who is all-powerful, who is morally perfect, who, may, who then makes a world in which suffering is possible and then becomes actual. I don't think there is a real contradiction there, but the question that people have, many sincere people have, is a more existential question, yeah. and that is, why uh, is my baby uh, mm -hmm. suffering from this terrible disease? Yeah. Why has my husband, who just retired, contracted terrible cancer. Why was my daughter murdered so brutally in the streets mm -hmm. and so forth? That's really their question. And that is not a, I would say, is not a question that you can, and that you ought to answer philosophically. I don't no. think you can really answer it philosophically. I don't think that you ought to try to give some kind of logical answer to it. What about yourself, Peter? I think that's profoundly true. The more you probe, the more you see that beneath the logical objections, there are personal objections. Absolutely. Because yeah. logic is a technique that we human beings use as persons to find the truth. It's not the only one, but it's an important one. Now, we have to give a logical answer. If they say, here is a knock them down, drag them out argument, uh, right. Uh, we have to answer it. Absolutely. Thomas, Thomas Aquinas, I think, gave the strongest and simplest argument for atheism in uh, uh, the objection number one to the existence of God in that famous article in the Summa. If one of two opposites is infinite, the other cannot exist. God is infinite goodness, therefore if there were God, there would be no kind of evil at all. There is, therefore there is no God. Right. Now that's a fair argument, but there's a, a, a very obvious answer to it the free will defense. God gave us free will out of love and we messed up. Absolutely. Yeah. But that answer is a narrative answer. It's not just a purely logical answer. Uh, and you have to get the atheist on the side of God existentially. If you were God, wouldn't you rather have a world with real human beings in it with free will rather than just a garden of vegetables or uh, robots? And almost everybody will say yes. And then you've got the heart engaged and not just the head. But even, even then it's difficult. Job, uh, the great classic about the problem of evil, Job has all sorts of logical and existential uh, questions to God. And when God shows up, he doesn't answer any of the logical questions. He just says, here I am, now you see me, and now you see yourself, and Job is satisfied. So somehow that's what we have to do. We have to get the students somehow, at least anonymously, into the presence of the, of the living God. Yes, absolutely. And I also think that the, the question for us Christians that is so crucial is the meaning of the cross, the, yeah. the, the deep, profound meaning of the cross. After all, Jesus crucified, that's God's own son, and there he has, and totally innocent, and there he has suffered this incredibly grotesque torture. Why? Why would, why would God do this? What's, what's the point? What kind of God is that? Jesus takes the suffering on himself. And the message, surely, I mean, surely, part of the message for us is um, that the worst 
thing that a human being is capable of, the very worst thing, the worst offense, the worst fault, the worst, the worst moral enormity, the worst grotesque evil that a human being is capable of, that can be forgiven. It is yeah. possible to yeah. find love, uh, peace, and forgiveness even in that, even in those monstrous circumstances. Yeah. That's. This is why we surround this grotesque and horrible symbol, the cross, instrument of torture, with gold. And why we celebrate the most dastardly deed ever committed, the deliberate murder of Almighty God, by a holiday we call Good Friday. Now that certainly doesn't seem to be logical, but it's wonderful. If, if that worst of evils can somehow be transformed into good, then little ones can do. And the thing about the cross is this. Uh, St. Paul says Jesus crucified the wisdom and the power of God. Somehow, divine power, the power of God, which we don't associate with someone being tortured to death or allowing himself to be tortured to death, somehow that is power. And when you consider it, when you realize that Jesus is innocent and that he was murdered, this was a kind of judicial murder mm -hmm. that took place long ago. Um, when you realize that this took place as it did, then you realize that in your being able to say he was innocent and what was done to him was wrong, absolutely wrong, that itself shows the power of good, doesn't it? Yeah, light it, over it, darkness. Absolutely it does. It, it shows the, the real power of goodness itself, that, that somehow goodness has a power that evil can never have. Yeah. That evil yeah. will always be condemned, even yeah. when it seems to triumph. Yes, yes, and it certainly does seem to triumph, which is why the atheist has a good argument for the problem of evil. That's why in St. John's Gospel, at the beginning, when St. John says the light shines in darkness, present, and the darkness didn't now, the translation varies. The darkness didn't overcome it. The darkness didn't absorb it. The darkness didn't understand it. All of those things can be true. I think what it means is this, that our history, the history of humanity, is going to be a history of the light shining in darkness, the light surrounded by darkness, a darkness that is always hostile to the light, mm -hmm. a darkness that can never really grasp it, can never absorb it, because if it absorbs it, it's destroyed by it, but also a darkness that can never really destroy the light itself. That light will always be there. And the, the, very, the very happening of the crucifixion, I think, shows that it's a horrible, monstrous act. And insofar as the powers of darkness succeeded in the crucifixion of Jesus, they lost. Insofar as they succeeded, they lost, exactly. The, uh, the very act of the darkness in causing suffering to the light, the very act of, of, of breaking the sacred heart, uh, is what saved the world. You know, there's a, there's a, a famous incident that happened in Germany where a boy who was a Jesus freak, they call themselves that, I mean, that's not, that's not a term of abuse. Mm -hmm. He stayed with a family, very secular people. The mother um, had been with someone else. She had a daughter with another man, and then she had a son with this fellow. He ended up in their backyard, this, this Jesus freak, and he stayed with this family he saw that the father was abusing, sexually abusing the girl. And he stayed there to try to protect the girl insofar as he could. He, he was very nonviolent. And the father saw him as a judge against mm -hmm. what he was doing. And he was beaten, he was tortured, this kid. He was abused horribly, and the mother she participated, she joined in the torture. And he, they, they beat him so badly that they knew he was dying. Mm. And so they brought him to a place where they could get rid of the body, just to throw him uh, on the ground. And it was near a river. And 
as the the boy who was uh, tatters in tatters was lying on the bank of the river the father in a fury asked where is your God now and the boy pointed to his heart and he said here and then in fury the father throws him into the river it was made into a movie called nothing bad can happen a german wow. film tore tanzt it is in german wow. and uh, very powerful uh, extraordinary that this kid in being beaten tortured and so on somehow somehow uh, the power of goodness the goodness in him was triumphant even over the monstrous evil of that fellow he was actually literally participating in the passion of the christ absolutely yeah that little word in that St. Paul uses so often, we are put into Christ, that's, that's the great mystery. Uh, when in the first eight chapters of Romans, which is the first systematic Christian theology, Paul announces his topic. He says it's going to be the justice of God, the righteousness of God. And what it centers on is uh, Christ on the cross. Yeah. The most unjust thing that ever happens is God's justice. Very strange, very mysterious, Absolutely. but very powerful. I remember Bishop Fulton Sheen back in the 50s uh, at the heart of the Cold War said, neither America nor Russia will conquer the world because Russia is the cross without Christ and America is Christ without the cross and only Christ and the cross will save the world. And you can say the same thing about Islam. Muslims will suffer. They don't have the real Christ but they will embrace the cross, as we don't. So they're tough, and we're not. But unless you put Christ together with the cross, unless you have, have the conflict of good and evil, such that good embraces evil, as Christ embraced the good thief on the cross, you don't have the whole picture. No, and it astonishes me, really, that we as Christians, who have this tremendous richness of the cross, the symbol of the cross, the reality of the cross, that we don't emphasize enough the, the, the beautiful theology of the cross, that in fact uh, we, we need to see Jesus there uh, suffering, dying, and forgiving, mm -hmm. suffering and dying with love, because after all, that's part of the Christian life, isn't it? It's the heart of it. It's the heart of it. I like to imagine some people watching the crucifixion. Uh, the good thief was probably a murderer as well as a thief, and he may have murdered some members of that family, stole all their money, there were no insurance policies, they're doomed for life, and they're glad that he's getting what he deserves. And then they hear Jesus forgive him and say, today you shall be with me in paradise. Uh, how do they feel? Probably very resentful. So if, if, if Jesus could talk to them, he would probably say, why are you living in the past? I'm living in the present. There is genuine repentance there, and there's genuine forgiveness here, and the two things meet, and, and that's heaven. You know, there's a great story. It just, you just reminded me of this. Um, Margaret Mary Alacoque claimed that she was visited by Jesus, by the Sacred Heart. And Claude de la Colombière was assigned to investigate whether what she was uh, experiencing was genuine or whether it was fake. Mm -hmm. And many people thought it was absolutely fake. All right. So he went to her, he spoke with her, and he just wasn't sure. So he put this test to Margaret Mary. He said, all right, when Jesus speaks to you next, when you have this vision of the Lord, and he comes to you next, you ask him, what was the last mortal sin that Father de la Colombia, that I committed? So you ask Jesus, what was the last mortal sin I committed? Will you do that? She said, I'll do it. He said, okay. Well, she went away. And when he met with her next time, he said, did you have a vision of the Lord? Yes, I did. Well, did you ask him, what was the last mortal sin that I, Claude de la Colombia, committed? She said, I did. And did he give you an answer? She said, he did. Well, what was the answer he gave you? He said, I forget. <laughs> That's great. That's yes. great. Yes. No, not living in the past, living in the yes. present. 
living that strikes in the me as very similar to a beautiful line from uh, a book by Monica Migliore Miller called The Theology, the Passion of the Christ. Uh, I always had a problem with uh, the Catholic doctrine. I didn't, un I accepted it, but I didn't understand it. That uh, Christ could have redeemed the world with a single drop of the precious blood, which has all the merit to, to, to take away all sins. But instead, he embraced the cross. Why did he do that? And then, in watching the movie, I found that uh, Mel Gibson. What, the movie? Oh, the, the Passion, the passion of, the Christ. of the Christ. Okay. Mel Gibson has Mary ask him the same question on the Via Dolorosa. Here he is, <sighs> hugging his cross like a teddy bear, and he's almost dead, and she's in agony, and she says, "I don't understand. Why do you have to do all this?" And he turns to her and says, "And this is my candidate for the greatest line in the history of cinema." See, Mother, I make all things new. And in the book, uh, Monica Miller says, why, if Christ could have redeemed the world with a single drop of his blood, did he give all 12 quarts in this horrible, bloody manner? And the answer was, because he had 12 quarts to give. That's what love does. The, the idea of the cross, uh, the most profound, the most profoundly deeply most moving answer to the problem of suffering it seems to me is just not sufficiently appreciated needs to be more appreciated it's in our tradition all the saints teach it we used to be taught to offer up our sufferings what a beautiful thought this, these sufferings can be transformed like the cross they can be they can be encased in gold they can be incredibly powerful uh, it's there, but it's not taught anymore in most places. It's, it's got to be recaptured. And the, the so-called answer to the problem of suffering ultimately is, is there uh, on the cross. Yeah. Uh, and our being able, our being allowed to offer our sufferings up with the sufferings of Christ. I mean, that, that truly is, it seems to me, the only ultimate answer to the problem yeah. of suffering. Yeah. Most people who bring up the problem of suffering as a reason for atheism uh, are thinking of physical suffering rather than spiritual suffering. And they're assuming that if there were a God who loves us, he would remove all suffering from the world. Th those are questionable assumptions. The worst yeah. suffering is not the suffering that comes to you, but the suffering that comes from you. Absolutely. That is absolutely true. And he didn't true. come into this world to, to remove all suffering. Uh, he came into this world to transform suffering so that even suffering can be part of the glory. There came a point, uh, I can say in my own life, when I experienced something that was a kind of suffering that I thought God could not redeem. Mm -hmm that no good could come out of yeah. it. In other words, we believe that yeah. if there is suffering, some good has got to come out of it. God yeah. has got to bring some good out of it that would not be possible did that suffering not yeah. happen. And at some point in my life, I experienced something that I thought God cannot bring good out of. Mm -hmm. This is just impossible. And yet, I can say God did bring some yeah. good out of it. That's, and that, that experience, by the way, of uh, undergoing a suffering and seeing the good in the suffering, that is an incredible yeah. blessing. He does that, but he doesn't do it by magic. He doesn't do it by power. He doesn't do it by, by moving chess pieces around the board no, or no. pushing down dominoes. No. He does it by inspiring us to do it with him. In that sense, we become co-redeemers, uses our free will. There's a, a great story about uh, two rabbis in Auschwitz, one had lost his faith and the other kept saying, God will, will save us, we are the chosen people, have faith in God. And the two of them were online to enter the gas chambers. And the believing rabbi, who said God will save us, went in first and his last words was, there is no God. And then the rabbi who had lost his faith entered and his last words were, Shema Yisrael, Adonai. You know, it's, it's free will, it's free choice. And that free choice, that free will, is something that we freely have to give to God, ultimately, just as we give it to uh, another person in love, we have to give it to God in love as well. This is, I think, maybe the deepest thing that Islam lacks, at least 
most Muslims. They're, they're wonderfully profound about the need for surrender and submission and total acceptance of the will of God. But the freedom of that submission and the joy of that submission, the activeness of that submission, that's awfully humanizing. It's not dehumanizing. Yes. That, and, well, it's, it's, it's what someone once said. To admit, really to admit, and freely to admit that you need forgiveness, mm -hmm. that you have done wrong, mm -hmm. would seem to be a horrible moment in which all of darkness is going to overcome you and mm -hmm. envelop you. But in fact, if you do it, and do it in the light of the, the light of the cross, the, the love that radiates from the cross of Christ, that, is, that becomes a moment of great salvation and greatest joy. And that admission is a terrific suffering. Yes, I mean, it is. Once, once you realize that you are guilty of genuine harm, you would gladly exchange that for any kind of physical pain. Which is why I, I think that purgatory is that spiritual pain rather than any physical pain. You see all the horror of your own sins, but you accept that. Absolutely. And that's, that's redemptive. Yeah. So that the light does is not overcome by the darkness. Yeah. 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 Well, that's a much better answer to the problem of evil than a merely logical answer. I think so. Although we have to give the logical answers too. Absolutely. But so many philosophers just stop with the logical answer and think their, their, their job is over. Uh, it's just begun. I remember uh, when, when I teach at BC, you go through logical arguments and then at the end of them, students will say, well, well okay, well, that's true. But I want God. In other words, what they want is the God who loves them. They want, that's what they want. This is why Job is satisfied at the end. I never understood that first until I, until I read Martin Buber, who said the reason Job is satisfied at the end and the reason God is also satisfied with Job at the end, even though Job was a rebel and admits it, and his prayers were very, certainly not pious and the free friend's prayers were, yet Job talks to God, not just about him. Right. And when God shows up, he says, here I am, and Job says, here I am, and that's heaven. Yeah. You need the answerer more than you need the answers. Well, that's the best we can do with the problem of evil. <laughs> I don't think we can do better than that because no. that's just pointing to what God did. That's right. So the answer to the problem of evil is the crucifix. Thank you for uh, listening and thinking with us. Uh, we'll see you again on the Philosopher's Bench.